Pet Life Radio. This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Thanks so much for listening to the show today, being here and being part of this fantastic offering we have. I can't wait. My good friend, the New York Times bestselling series author, Rita Mae Brown, is going to be joining us. And we'll talk to Rita Mae a little bit about her latest book, Hiss and Tell. And then we'll talk a little bit about the writing styles and what's going on in the uh, publishing world. And also just human interest and sign of the time chat, I'm sure we'll have. So everybody hang tight. We'll come back right after these commercial breaks. You're listening to Pet Life Radio, Animal Rights Show. How many of you have pets? My hand's raised. Now think about how lucky you are to have such a sweet little pet in your life. And that pet is lucky to have you too. But unfortunately, there are countless pets out there that don't have a home to call their own. However, Bob's from Skechers is trying to change that. So we developed Bob's for dogs and cats to help pets in need. With every purchase of adorable Bob's footwear or fun, stylish apparel, or even the cutest Bob's pet accessories, Skechers makes a donation to Petco Love to help save shelter pets. And with your help, we've already saved the lives of over 1 million pets and raised over $7 million. So while you're getting style and comfort with features like Skechers' famous memory foam cushioning, you're also helping to save an adorable pet in need and helping another lucky owner be connected with a future best friend and companion because happiness is having a loving pet by your side. Find Bob's at a Skechers store, Skechers.com, select pet co-locations, or wherever stylish footwear is sold. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Joining me now is New York Times bestselling author. You know her, you love her. She's our big time friend, and I'm always thrilled to talk to her. Of course, we're talking to Rita Mae Brown. Rita Mae, welcome to the show. Oh, Tim, it's good to hear your voice and be back. It's been forever. You know, it seems like yesterday, but it's been forever. I think that's how it goes, isn't it? Well, you know, we were, it is for everybody. I mean, COVID has just upended everything, but we're getting back to it. And, you know, I, I think what I think of most, and you probably do too, is all those animals that have been surrendered. My God, I hope people do go to the SPCA and animal, you know, like almost home those places and help these guys out. Yeah, you know, that's the odd sign of the times, uh, you know, the folks that uh, when we had COVID going on, everybody wanted companionship. So they went out and adopted, in most cases, I would say, a furry friend or maybe even a feathered or fin friend, who knows, scaled friend. <laughs> but yeah, they adopted all these wonderful animals. And I saw in my little uh, neighborhood, people that never had animals before started getting, you know, one or two dogs and walking them around the neighborhood. And that's all fantastic. But the challenge is, you know, animals are expensive. They are lifetime commitment. And so you have to be prepared to uh, to do that. But what you get in return is so fantastic. It is. I mean, it's the only love money can buy. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I know my uh, pups and kitties and stuff have spent my uh, share of wealth. So <laughs> ask, yeah. ask the local veterinarians. They know me by name. <laughs> yeah, same here. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So we're back to talking about the book. So the latest book is Hiss and Tell. It takes a cat to write the perfect mystery. Of course, we're talking about our good pal, Sneaky Pie Brown. So tell us a little bit about this book. Maybe introduce some characters that are new and some uh, some of the ones that have been in the previous books. And without giving away everything, tell us a little bit about the latest mystery. Well, it surprised me. In that, and I don't want to give away all of the story either, but what I was writing about, it was happening in our country. And then when I finished, it got so much worse. And I thought, you know, it is, it, all that research I did, and now it's superseded by even worse numbers. But people, I don't know why people do what they do. I guess I never will. But the animals seem to know more than I do and more than all of us do. And the animals, of course, began to figure it out a little earlier because of their sense of smell and their observational powers are so sharp because they depend on us in a way. 
So they really need to understand us better than we understand ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I always see, you know, animals, we always hear the terminology, they live in the moment, which is true. As, as long as we don't drag them back into the past, if they, especially if they had a tough past, they'll live in the moment. And that's what they try to do. But they take things at, uh, I don't know if I'd say face value, but they take them as they are. They understand them quicker than we do, better than we do. And I think the key thing is animals are more accepting than we are. And we rationalize everything. I mean, we try to sp explain things away. They just take it at face value, like you said, and then deal with it. And uh, we generally don't deal with it until it's a full-blown crisis. We deny a lot, Tim. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think we also, you know, when we talk about a full-blown crisis, we create a lot of that ourselves. You know, something that's minor all of a sudden becomes this major thing that never should have been that, that concerning to people. Well, people make careers out of it. Mm. Oh, boy. I mean, when you think about that. I mean, I know we're not going to get into politics and this and that, but it, and everything is monetized. There's nothing that somebody can't figure out how to make a buck out of it. The animals don't have those needs or they don't have those egos either. So they can literally see reality much better than we can. And I've had fun with this in this series all along, you know, trying to look at the world through their eyes. And I have a, a new dog in this. Uh, well, since you and I talk, mm -hmm. a, an Irish wolfhound. So here's this little corgi and this Irish wolfhound who, who's a puppy who, of course, gets bigger and bigger. And the puppy's trying to understand humans. And the fun is, part of it, that the corgi and the kitties explain to them, you know, like they don't have a good nose, don't expect anything there, <laughs> just odd things. And they eat things differently than we do, but that's okay. We'll get our food. That food's important. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. One of my schnauzers, uh, he's a mama's boy for sure. And he'll do anything for mama. He's her shadow. He's there all the time. If my wife is in a room, he's there, uh, except for food time. Then he runs back and forth because he's like, I love you, mama, but food, it's food, you know? <laughs> I, I know. I know. The good thing about food is it does make it a little easier to train them when they're puppies. But, um, but also, can you imagine what some of this stuff smells like to them? Oh, with yeah. With fabulous olfactory powers. It must be just overwhelming. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because I had, I had pulled out the slow cooker yesterday and put the, the liner in it. So if you those of you that don't know you, there's liners you can get for your crock pot, your slow cooker. And so I've been using those and they're fantastic. So it makes it super easy to clean up. But the thing is when you're you're cooking something and when you're done with it, you pour out whatever is left, the uh, soup or the juice or whatever it may be. And then you have this plastic bag that you have to do something with. Well, I made a mistake of putting it in one of our trash cans. And <laughs> yeah. And so here's my toy schnauzer, you know, all, all 10 pounds of her sniffing this thing like crazy. And I'm like, what? Do you, it's in a tin can. What do you? And she's like, oh, no, it's right here. I know if I figure out a way to circle this can, I can get to that. And so long story short, I end up taking the plastic liner and putting it in another plastic bag and putting it in the freezer <laughs> in order to, to distract the odor. That's uh, pretty smart, though. Uh, good idea. I did. I knew she would never get into the trash, but I'd spend days telling her, no, that's not for you. Come here. <laughs> One of the other things, you know, talking about how good your little schnauzer's nose is, they can tell when people are on drugs and we can't. Like, we can generally smell alcohol on someone. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it's strong. I mean, it, it can sometimes be overwhelming. But we can't smell drugs generally. They can. And uh, they know long before we do if somebody's going down, pretty much it's a one-way ticket down. And uh, I think people, and this is somewhat part, part of the uh, story, how the animals begin to figure out what's really at stake. One of the problems, I think, with anybody in, involved in criminal activity is they become very, very good liars. They tell you what you want to hear, and um, you're satisfied. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. And uh, animals are true to what they they know. And, you know, so they don't have to sit there, as you said, you know, and, and analyze it to death to try to figure out what they, the hidden meaning or something going on. And it, it is what it is. Right. So how does it tie in with the characters in the book and the latest mystery, using all these senses and, and identifying what's going on in the uh, at the present time? Well, as usual, there's oddities that occur. There's there's generally a body that shows up somewhere in, in these, and they begin to figure out what's really at stake. 
and nobody can quite understand because these these murders and also just disorganization that's going on in life doesn't make sense. But of course, the it makes sense to the animals because they're figuring it all out, and so the human beings are trusting the very people they shouldn't. That's very good. That's a very good way to take a look at it. So always always look at at your animals for for the proper guidance and to identify things. You know, it's a real interesting you mentioned that because I uh, in um, my book talking with dogs and cats and I've written articles on this in the past as well about using our dogs as a barometer. You know, it, they can like you had been mentioning, they can identify things long before we do. But we spend so much time sort of in the outer ethers, not focused on what our animals are trying to tell us or what's going on in our world, where if we would just stop and recognize that they're trying to get a message through, take a breath, let that message come to you, and then trust what you're receiving. And so use that that, that animal as a barometer. So if your animal is feeling, for instance, feeling off that day, not having a good day, or maybe is too anxious that day, whatever it may be, well, the first thing is not to blame your animal for that. It's to take a breath, see what's going on with you, what's going on with uh, anyone in your household, what's going on you know, in just your state of being. And more than likely, you're going to find out there's something that's off. The energy's off. There's something going on within you or the household that your animal's just basically trying to get a message out to let you know about that. Do you think most people know how to read their dogs? I think they yeah, spend, if we spend time getting into that space, they can. I think it goes back to, you know, that telepathic connection that animals have with each other to communicate. They desperately try to get that back to us. And when we're very young, we can communicate with all energy around us because we don't know any better. You know, when we're children, we don't, we don't know any better, but we have that gift, we have that telepathic gift within us. That's why when we can have conversations of better understanding with animals and plant life and everything around us, the challenge is as we get older, as we get into to school, organized uh, education, that gets taught out of us. We're taught to act and, and speak and, and do things in a certain manner, and we forget that instinctual ability to be able to connect And I think that's the key. If we just slow down and breathe and allow ourselves to be in that moment with our animals, we'll receive messages. They could be words, colors, feelings, pictures, emotions, whatever it may be. And then once we get that information, trust it and don't overanalyze it. As you mentioned, you know, it's uh, we tend to peel back that onion a little bit too far. And the next thing you know, we have no no onion at all. So (laughs) that's the key. That's a good way to put it. I mean, you, you see it around you every day. And one of the things that I often think about, and I'm glad that people have animals. I'm glad they have, you know, little dogs in the cities and their kitties. And, and in the suburbs, of course, you can have more because it's a start. It's a reconnection to nature because most people are really quite distant from nature now. Like a lot of people don't even know what the equinox is. Yeah. Well, you know, it's the time when the Earth's rays are at the equator. So everything is not tilted. It's the one time the Earth is not tilted on its axis. Well, let's start tilting today. And that changes how the life is too. And the animals respond to these things immediately. Or they know because they are already getting twigs for their nest. Or, you know, the dogs are out there and they're going to know and the possums are out there too. And they want to find one because everybody's either breeding or they've already got the babies on the ground. We don't know that. And so we miss a lot. And we miss I know this is maybe not in the novel, but we miss our own breeding cycles, and we make just a mess of it. Yeah. Welcome to humankind. <laughs> I know. I know. I mean, um, if, if guys at bars had a dog, they would have such an easier time of picking up girls. <laughs> that's it. That's it. But you know, that's a big business now. I don't, I don't know if it's big business, but there are businesses out there that will rent you a dog for a day. <laughs> oh, rent- God, that's funny yep absolutely another great way to do it uh, you know not that i've ever done this i've been married a, quite a while but what i've learned is you know with the going back to the local uh, uh, shelters and rescues you had mentioned oftentimes you can volunteer your time at a rescue and those dogs for instance need exercise so they'll let you take one of the dogs out for the day yeah, so I, I, I'm not encouraging all you single guys out there, or gals, to go <laughs> rent your dog for the day. But, you know, it is something that's out there, apparently. But, um, yeah, I've seen that. I've seen places uh, like in Hawaii, they'll, they'll rent you a dog. It's one of their trail dogs. So you can go trail hiking, but you have a dog as your companion. So kind of wonderful. Yeah, the American, as you said, all for a dollar, if there's a dollar in it. 
<laughs> Except for our rest. Yeah. One of the things I had the most fun of in, uh, in the Sneaky Pie books, the, the main kitty characters, Mrs. Murphy and her sidekick, is a overweight cat. We're not going to do fat shaming for cats, but she <laughs> is overweight. And um, they, the cats also have a great sense of smell. And you don't have to establish Harry Harrison, the, the woman who's your, your main character, she and her husband, and then her best friend and her husband. But what happens is, of course, the cats and the dogs communicate a little differently because uh, the cats can get up closer to the people often because they can jump up higher. But what people don't realize is cats do have a great sense of smell, but they love you. I mean, everybody thinks, you know, well, cats are independent and they don't care. No, they really do love you. And often when Harry gets in trouble, the cats and the dogs work in concert to get her out of the mess or get her out before she gets killed, which is usually what happens. And they do. It takes people longer. Even when you live out in the country, even when you know your animals, it just takes people so much longer. We're all wrapped up in our bills and, you know, oh, my God, you know, here this one came in and with inflation, it's twice as big as it was last month. And, hey, I we all worry. We do. But what we're worrying about are all man-made problems. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, the over-dramatization of things. I think, like you said, it's big business there too, you know, uh, with our news outlets, et cetera. But yeah, we, things we didn't know about the day before all of a sudden become a crisis the next day. So <laughs> you know, that's, <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. yeah, a couple small banks go under. I'm sorry to hear that. And then all of a sudden everybody's like, oh, I got to pull my money out and give it back to the big bank. Which uh, the big bank just got, you know, lawsuits handed against it a year ago, uh, stating that they did some, you know, things that were not in the best interest of their uh, the people that bank there. So, you know, it, maybe it's an endless cycle. Maybe my dad had it right. Maybe just a, a good old ball jar, good mason jar. <laughs> there <laughs> With, you have it. <laughs> hey, money hidden in the back. And yeah. Uh, yeah, don't know where he buried all that money, but uh, one of these days I'm going to find that stuff. Well, I mean, speaking of capitalizing on things, look at the sale of pet products now. Anyway, I mean, it's way over a billion dollars. Again, they were smart. They saw a need. They answered it. I don't think we're being cheated, whereas in some other instances, we certainly are. But that's fascinating, too, that people are reconnecting on a level where they want to do for their pets, but they want to do it the way they do for humans. I don't really think your dog cares about the color of its bed. Yeah, they care about uh, getting love and having shelter and having food, and uh, that's the key. I don't mind it either. <laughs> I've never found anyone to pay my bills, give me the back seat in the house, and tell me how much they love me. You know? <laughs> but every cat and dog out there that is in a home, it gets this every day. So you really do have to question your intelligence. That's right. Well, I've always said, you know, if I could do anything, I'd live a dog's life. That's where I'd yeah. work <laughs> I can't write about this, obviously, but it fascinates me. The people going into Ukraine, saving the animals. I mean, that's just remarkable. And in cases, being able to reunite them, and in other cases, taking them across the border to Poland. Are the people still finding animals in the Turkish earthquake? I mean, people risking themselves. And it makes you think, okay, maybe we are beginning to understand that all creatures are connected in some fashion. Yeah. And hopefully it's a great lesson that we can stick to. You know, hopefully we won't just forget about it by the time we wake up tomorrow. Hopefully it is a trend that that is uh, a way of life, I should say, not a trend, a way of life that's coming back around to us. I really hope that. I, I am very hopeful for life and society and people connecting with animals at uh, a much deeper level. Some do it better than others, but uh, I think we're, we're getting there, but there, we still got long strides to go. Which I hope I make that clear in Hiss and Tell. But the one thing about Hiss and Tell, which is, I'll just say this in case your readers are reading other people's series, it's very difficult to know how much information to tell you about Mrs. Murphy or Tucker the dog or the humans. Because if somebody just picks that book up, they don't know who these characters are. So you have to tell them something without dragging down the person that's been reading them all along. And that sometimes is where... I just wish, I just want to have the cat write the book. Like, sit here, you do it. You figure it out. <laughs> you know, this is giving me. So what I do is I have a cast of characters in the front to help. 
Well, that's the key. You know, the great thing about, you know, the whole series, the Mrs. Murphy mystery series and everything you're doing with Sneaky Pie, you know, they are standalone books. You can pick one up and, you know, this one, which is one number, what, 28, I think. A lot <laughs> of the series. <laughs> so uh, you can pick up this book, enjoy it, connect the characters, and you know, not have to, uh, and then go back and get the other twenty-seven. That's the key. But on the other hand, like you said, you know, you have to build for that new audience, but yet you have all these fans that are going to keep your toes to the fire if you uh, move the wrong way. You know, if uh, if a character gets taken away uh, too soon, you know, uh, they're going to wonder what happened to that character. Right. And then, of course, over the years, there's a lot of characters. Like, um, there's the church lady that uh, Harry worked with in the post office when she worked in the post office before they changed the rules and she couldn't take the animals. So she left the post office. She didn't exactly go postal. She just left <laughs> postal, you know, but stuff like that. And Mrs. Hogan Dober, a character I greatly adore. So you have to every now and then bring them back, but they don't they don't fit in every mystery. Obviously, or you'd have a book that was as large as the Cedars of Lebanon. But it's fun for me to see who is part of a mystery. Like the one I'm doing now, uh, uh, I'm doing another uh, Mrs. Murphy now, is um, Susan, who's Harry's best friend. They've been friends since childhood. Uh, is a, our delegate to the House of Representatives, which we have, well, it's called the House of Delegates in Virginia. And uh, he's introducing a bill, which is not really political. It's just about cleaning up the road. And this thing just erupts into this enormous fight. And I'm, I'm having fun with that because it's, of course, it's happening everywhere. When it comes home, which it does, as all of these things do, the animals have to deal with it. And they, they don't understand it at all, but they solve it in their own way. Absolutely. Well, listen, we're, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll come back and chat a little bit more uh, with uh, Rita Mae Brown and Sneaky Pie Brown and talk about the Mrs. Murphy mystery. And uh, I want to pick your brain a little bit, Rita Mae, more about uh, the book as well as these cast of characters and keeping everything sorted. Uh, that's <laughs> always fascinating to me. So everybody hang tight. We'll come back right after this commercial break. You're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, Stitcher, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Joining me again is my wonderful, wonderful friend. So great to talk to her. It's New York Times bestselling author Rita Mae Brown and talking about her latest book, Hiss and Tell, part of the uh, Mrs. Murphy mystery series. Now, Rita Mae, right before break, we were talking about characters, you know, bringing back characters, reintroducing new characters, these type of things. I know that as an author, you have to get intimate with these books, even though we talked about there's, you know, pushing 30 books or so uh, in this series, you get intimate with those characters. But it's very fascinating to me that how you keep those sorted and how they become ingrained into, I would imagine, who you are as as a writer. Because to me, if I was to write this, be fortunate enough to write this many books in a series, I'd have to have a big Excel spreadsheet or a, a, a pie <laughs> chart on the wall telling me, reminding me who all these different characters were and which ones I can't afford to uh, leave off of this one and who I can read. How do you keep that all sorted? Is it part of just these characters become part of who you are as a writer or uh, is there some other magical method that you have? I feel that I know them and I do. I do. They're not, I mean, they're not taken from life exactly, but they're taken, they're the people I live around who live around me. And of course, we're all country people, which makes it easier for me too, because it's a certain set of attitudes. But they've grown and I've grown, and that's been fun to do. But I, at this point in my life, I can't really imagine not being with them in a way. And some of the books, 
there's an 18th century storyline. The early ones, there aren't. And my publisher has said, you know, this is getting, some people want less of the 18th century, a few want more. But what happened in the book, You've Got Hiss and Tell, is some of those locations are forward in this book. You see them in the 21st century, because they're still here. And in Virginia, that's true. A lot of the old stuff is still here. And, for instance, they go to a restaurant that was originally a body house in Richmond. Things like that. I have fun with stuff like that. So you see how things have changed over time, but maybe not as much as you really think. Not that it's a body house now. It's a very high-end restaurant. So they're all there eating. But the pictures of the proprietor of the original house of, shall we say, soiled doves is there, and she's quite formidable. She's formidable even in death. And those are the kind of things that kind of interest me, and I just carry them with me. But I'm surrounded by it. I mean, I'm 10 miles away from Lady Astor's home, where she grew up. Oh, my. Yeah. I mean, so everywhere I go, there's something. I'm about maybe 20 miles from where Patrick Henry's mother lived, and Patrick Henry's mother was as part of the Cole family, which was, well, they're still here. I mean, that's the other thing. They're all still here in one way or the other. So I I like folding that in, but I do realize that's not the case in many states. I think it is in most of the original 13. I really do. I mean, there's a house I can show you in New York City that was there before the Revolutionary War, and it's still there, and people are still living in it. But um, in the main, money has wiped all the older buildings out, and now you just basically get rectangles turned on their ends. (laughs) it's not very imaginative but there's so much we can draw on and one of the things that I loved about that 18th century storyline is I hope I was making it clear that it's still with us but it all still is I mean I don't care where you are I don't care where you are in Georgia it's still there what do you think of that from your aspect then is it a still a fascination of living there after all you know you've been there for quite a while on the farm is it a fascination about that is it just your intrigue about history in general because I know you do a ton of research and and there's a lot of historical things that you fold into the books I do I mean I do I mean I, I love it all and I, some of what I love is our forebears their love of animals you'll go to many of these old estates and there's often little graveyards for the animals. Mm -hmm. There are the slave graveyards, which are still there for the enslaved people, which are many of them are being revitalized, which is really kind of wonderful. I don't think you should ever forget anybody that leaves you. But there's also little little animal graveyards, and sometimes the animal's buried next to the person, and there's a little stone, often it's laid flat on the ground, but it'll have like Roger and then his birth date and his death date or whatever. And you realize looking at it, or somebody will say, beloved dog. Or, and those people love their animals just as much as we do. Washington loved his horses. I mean, okay, well, he was a great horseman. Right. He loved them. I mean, and his wife knew that, so she made sure he would be riding every day when he was home, which was hardly ever the poor guy. But just these kind of things where people realize... My husband is under a lot of pressure. He needs to get out. Or she's had a tough day at work. Let her walk the dog or let her have the dog in her lap and she drinks a cup of tea. We've always known these things. Yeah, absolutely. We just have to recognize and honor them, I think, a little little bit better in some cases. In some cases. Uh, if you're taking the dog for a walk, put away the mobile device. That's what I always say. Right. Well, fortunately, our ancestors didn't have that. (laughs) But that's part of our problem. How do you know what's on that mobile device is real? Oh, oh boy. Now we're talking. That's another discussion. But how do you know? Yeah, I make calls and barely make texts. And that's, you know, (laughs) I don't go much further than that anymore. You know, you have to, their social media obviously is, uh, you're, most people are involved in that in some fashion. But, uh, you know, you've got to shut that off and uh, not believe everything you read. That's That's it. True. And read more about Rita Mae Brown and Sneaky Pie Brown and Hiss and Tell, the Mrs. Murphy mystery series. That's what you need to do. Well, you know, you're so right. (laughs) <laughs> I like the way you think. <laughs> While I got you on the phone, I have to tell you of a really magical experience. I have a bald eagle family that lives on my farm. Wow. Um, there's, a, there's a north branch of the Rockfish River that's one of my borders. And so there's a nest down there. And I don't show people where it is because I don't want them to bother it. Mm-hmm. But the other day, the female, and you know they're huge. If you've ever seen them. Oh, yeah. They are huge. 
So she was coming up from one of the horse pastures and just, just just walking. And one of the dogs, who's young, started going for her. She didn't move. She just opened her wings. And that dog saw that wingspan, turned around and ran back to me so fast. I mean, it was wonderful. And it was it was about as real as it gets because all she would have had to do would be to fly and hit the puppy on the head with her balled up claws. Those talons can knock you out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so she knew she was smart enough to know that uh, not a threat. I'm just going to spread my wings and <laughs> send the message of but don't bother with me. I mean, this is the stuff I get to see. I'm not looking at the Kardashians. I'm looking at bald eagles. That's it. That is so that's so fantastic. You know, because it's really interesting you, you mentioned that. We went. We were fortunate enough to go on a cruise many years ago up to Alaska. And, uh, of course, each port you get to go in the city and, you know, the towns, most of them are towns. One thing I noticed, which I thought was really peculiar, is that every tourist – that don't get to see bald eagles on a regular basis were just fascinated. I was fascinated. We would we have probably uh, more photos of that trip with bald eagles than we do anything else. But the locals, the people there in town, uh, they treat them as if they were you know the common crow. It wasn't a big deal. It wasn't a nuisance. And I'm like, to me, it's how do you? First of all, I get excited about crows. If they're around, it's a good omen. It's a good sign. It's one of my wife's uh, spirit animals. So we we pay attention to when we have a murder of crows around. I think that's what they said. That trip, they were like, ah, it's just you know, it's just another crow, I, aka a bald eagle. What? <laughs> well, it's wonderful to live with all of this stuff, and I try to bring some of it into the book. I mean, I don't try to overload it, but just maybe get people a little more alert to the world around them. I mean, even if you're living in the city, there's still nests. You know, there's parks, there's foxes in those parks, there's all manner of, of bird life, depending on where you are. And of course, then you can see them migrate. I mean, anybody can see that even in a in a city. And if you just pay attention, it can alert you to your own rhythm because we we're blind to our own rhythms. Yeah, absolutely. And we're talking about mobile devices. Well, we do have mobile devices. Uh, we also have uh, gigantic cell towers, which are not good, but they are excellent places for uh, bald egos and coumarans and uh, you know various uh, birds <laughs> to make their nests on top of. One of the fun things is to watch all of the animals here, I mean the domestic animals, watching the birds because they, they'll come up to my back door, which is like a you know, a glass door, really. So they come right up and they look in. The birds, you know, the cardinals and the blue jays and the orchard orioles, all these beautiful birds and tons of woodpeckers. They'll look in at the house animals and the house animals are looking out. And it's sort of, that's why I have the blue jay in almost all of the uh, Mrs. Murphy books and in Hiss and Tell because the blue jays are real smart ass. There's no other word for it. Just a naughty bird. Yes. And it drives the cats crazy because they can't get them. And then there's a snake also that tends to be important from time to time because I have a lot of black snakes, which I want. It's mm-hmm. not that I don't want them. I'm happy to have more. Uh, they do a lot of your work for you. But um, I just like all of that give and take. And the idea that I'm not sure there is any animal that is wrong. They're just animals that are wrong for us. Oh, absolutely. There's a reason for them to be here, for sure. And, uh, yeah, when you see a giant uh, black snake and you're not used to that, it's definitely uh, taking a step back. <laughs> you get startled. But like you said, they, they take care of all the uh, the vermin and all the stuff that is around, you know, even the snakes that are poisonous. They'll take care of them for you as well. So it's always yeah, good. Like you said. Yeah, it's always good to have one. My kitties bring me baby garter snakes when they're born. This is a big prize. So here I am with a garter snake in my hand, and I have to figure out where can I put this so the cats can't get it again because they don't want it killed. But some animals are frightened of snakes, like some horses are, some aren't. It's an interesting animal because it sets people off, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and each animal, just like each human, you know, has their own personality, their own likes and dislikes, their own worries and fears, and their own, their own excitement. So each one of them is unique, though some breeds have certain breed-specific things going on, like humans do. But uh, they definitely have their own personality. So as you said, some, some aren't going to be afraid of the snakes, some are. So you have to really tune in your animal to figure out what's, uh, what's going on. 
every now and then, Tim, I have a loose moment because I love Matilda, the big black snake in the Sneaky Pie books. And I think maybe Matilda can solve a mystery. And then I think nobody's ever going to go for that. <laughs> 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 Don't forget that one. But I'd love to do it. God, it would make me laugh. Um, it really would. Oh, my gosh. When everybody picks up a copy of the latest book, Hiss and Tell, or the Mrs. Murphy mystery series, uh, what do you hope they get from that? Uh, is the, the Or should I ask, When you first started this wonderful, wonderful series, did you have an idea what you were hoping the message and and the feeling that you were hoping to get from that? Has that changed over the years? No, it really has. I mean, I've been, I want people to honor animals. I want them to realize there's so much to learn. I want them to realize we are so out of touch on so many levels. We're literally making ourselves sick. And uh, we are. We think we're the crown of creation and we're not. We're destroying creation. And if you just sit down, take a deep breath, and look around you, there are other creatures, and they have things you you can learn from. They can teach you, literally. You don't need to shoot them. You don't need to kill anybody. I mean, unless, you know, it's a poisonous steak and you stepped on it, then either hopefully you can get away. But you know what I mean. There's really very little danger out there in the wild. Every now and then there is. But in the main, you're perfectly safe. Sit and listen and watch. The other thing I really wanted to do was, as you know, I'm a classics major, Greek and Latin. Right. I have absolutely no desire to write books that show you how smart I am. (laughs) Like, hey, I've read Thucydides and you haven't. That doesn't really mean I'm smart. That just means I read Greek. If I understood it and learned from it, yeah, then it does mean I'm smart. Uh, I will say that. But I want you to pick up a book, read it, laugh, have, have some good humor in it, and laugh at the animals, and start thinking maybe about your life. You know, could I do more? Is there more I could help other people or animals or, you know, because every book has something you can learn. I mean, they're not just to take you away. They're not just like pablum for the mind. If you want to learn something, you can. But if not, at least you'll have some time of relaxation. And maybe, you know, maybe having some laughter and maybe you'll have a chihuahua on your lap. Who knows? (laughs) <laughs> I love it. I love it. I think that's the perfect sentiment. I think that you hit it right on the head. And that that tagline, that tradition, uh, how you've done it from the beginning till uh, the present book, Hiss and Tell, is consistent. It does allow you uh, to, to take a step away, get involved, learn a, a lot, the history and the research and all the stuff that you do in, in the books, connect with the various uh, characters in the books. And yeah, if you can do that with an animal on your lap, I think you're in good shape. <laughs> People are beat up, Tim. They're tired. They're pressured. They're under a lot of stress, some of it of their own making, but much of it not. It's the society in which we live. And anything that gives them a moment's peace or reflection or, you know, like even if it's just walking the dog around the block, so at least you got out and did a little bit of exercise, that's good. But maybe the book will encourage you to do more. Absolutely. Well, you did a fantastic job, as always, on this. Uh, everybody, pick up a copy of the book. It's uh, Hiss and Tell. It takes a cat to write the perfect mystery from Rena Mae Brown, Sneaky Pie Brown, part of the uh, Mrs. Murphy mystery series. Uh, you're going to enjoy it, as always. I know your fans are loving the book, as well as uh, the uh, new fans coming along uh, reading the books for the first time. Well, thank you. Well, listen, we're going to come to the end of the show today. I want to thank everyone for listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. I want to thank the uh, producers and sponsors for making this show possible. Uh, if you have any questions, ideas, uh, thoughts, or people you want to hear from uh, on the show, drop us a line. You can go to PetLifeRadio.com and drop us a line, and we'll be glad to uh, entertain your comments and uh, bring on the people you want to hear from most. And while you're there, check out all the other wonderful uh, shows and hosts. It's a cornucopia of great entertainment all about animals. That's the way we like it. So until next time, write a great story about the animals in your life. And who knows, you may be the next uh, guest on Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Have a great day. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.